I don't know if I'm going to be any good at this. I don't know if they're going to like what I'm going to have to say. What can I say to myself right now that will actually get me out onto this stage? And the thing that I came up with was, I can't wait to do this the second time. You're listening to an Apex Mindset episode of the RCN podcast, where we learn from inspiring individuals who push the boundaries to reach extreme levels of success. Apex Mindset, elevate your life. On this Apex Mindset episode of the RCN podcast, the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, Jason Pfeiffer. I have really reoriented myself around doing things for the purpose of building, and that has changed everything. If you try something and you like it, or you try something and you hate it, either way, in the context of an experiment, it has been a success. I was talking to Ryan Reynolds because I get to talk to interesting people for the magazine. He said to me that to be good at something, you have to be willing to be bad. So there's some new technology in the construction space. You're going to try it. It's, it's going to be imperfect. The better question to ask is, is this new problem better than the old problem? When change happens, that's fine because all we need to do is figure out another way to express the thing that's really deep inside of us. All right, today we are excited to welcome Jason Pfeiffer with us on the podcast. Jason, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. We are excited to talk to you. Um, I actually just finished your book, loved it. I see it behind you there. Sweet. Build for Tomorrow. Uh, Lots of exciting information inside your book. And as well as, um, honestly, I, I just found you over the last several months seeing you on other podcasts and you're a very inspirational person. Well, thank you. And for, appreciate that. for the industry that we work in, the reason I wanted to talk with you is we work in a lot of uh, construction engineering worlds, and we are a part of all these new technologies that are coming out. And so one of the things that really resonated with me about you is your topics of change and innovation and mm-hmm. how the difficulties of them. So uh, excited to talk with you. But before we really dig into that meet, we really like starting with a little bit of background on our guests. We don't have to spend a lot of time there, but would love for you to give a little bit of your short story of like your journey into uh, the the role that you're in. Sure. I'm excited to get into the technology stuff because I'm sure tech is changing your industry rapidly. My quick backstory is that I started as a community newspaper reporter 20 years ago and then got into magazines and then bounced around national magazines, Men's Health, Fast Company, even Maxim Magazine. And I really, for the majority of my career, thought of myself just purely as a media guy, as a writer, as an editor. But when I got to Entrepreneur, I started to spend time, obviously, speaking to entrepreneurs every day and absorbing the way that they think. And I came to realize that the way entrepreneurs think is just so radically different from the way that everyone else in the world thinks and that it is infectious. Mm. And the more time that you spend with these folks, the more it shapes your understanding of the world around you and the opportunities that other people don't see. And you start to think of yourself differently. And that is exactly what happened to me. I now have my, in addition to running Entrepreneur Magazine, I have my own company. I produce all sorts of media, I speak, I consult, I think of myself very much as an entrepreneur because now I am, I juggle a ton of different things. And I'll tell you the core insight, although there's so many of them, but the core insight that I think really shifted me was back in 2018, my wife and I wrote a romantic comedy novel together. Very different from Build for Tomorrow, the book that I have out now, which is really very much centered on the work that I do now about helping people manage change. But back then, my wife and I wrote a romantic comedy. It was just, you know, a fun project. We'd worked on it for a couple of years. It came out on a major publisher. And media friends of ours would all say the same thing whenever they heard that we had sold this book, which was, congratulations, that's so awesome. But entrepreneurs didn't say that. What entrepreneurs said was, oh, that's interesting. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. And- I was trying to figure out why we were getting these two reactions. And then I realized the answer is because entrepreneurs, unlike everyone else, think vertically. That's the term I've come up with it. They think vertically, which is to say that the only reason to do something is because it is the foundation upon which the next thing will be built. Whereas 
most people, myself included for most of my career, think horizontally, which is to say, I'm going to do something and then I'm going to move along. And I'm going to kind of start and do something else. and I'm going to move along. And we don't build intentionally in the way that entrepreneurs do. So of course, to entrepreneurs, why would I write this book? Only for the purposes of clearly doing something else that's related to it. But that wasn't the case. I just did it. Yeah. And I have really reoriented myself around doing things for the purpose of building. And that has changed everything. Building for tomorrow. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> no, I that is that's a great share. I appreciate you sharing that. I I have found that naturally to be the process in my mind as an entrepreneur that back before starting my first company, when I was just in a job that I didn't love, I didn't mm -hmm. realize I didn't realize you could do so much. It, yeah. it felt it feels like before you start listening to other entrepreneurs or having these types of conversations, it feels like so many people are living in a blind of of just this is my this is our job. This is our option. Like we have to go get a nine to five. We have to do this thing. And you don't think about the, the capabilities. When I started following and listening to other people and reading other books, that's what opened my mind to see that idea of building something bigger. And, you know, mm. the idea of starting a podcast for, for us, it wasn't ever like, let's just do a podcast. It was, yeah, we're yeah. wanting to create a podcast to educate. And then where is that going to lead? It, it always had to be those stepping stones. Um, absolutely right. love that share. That's, okay. yeah, that's exactly right. And that's the only, that, look, that's the way to build things. That's the way to think is what is the function? What is the purpose? And how can the thing that I'm doing today set me up for tomorrow? Was there a specific interview that inspired you? Was there a specific person that you talked with that was like, that really shifted your perspective of how to look at life through that entrepreneur lens? Not any one particular one. It was really about absorbing what people were saying and the way that people were thinking. This is the thing that interests me the most is not what any one person says, but rather trying to understand the logic inside of their brains. But certainly over the years, I have just accumulated all these fascinating things that people have told me that have made a difference and have helped reframe the way that I think about things. I'll just share one real quick, which will be appropriate for anybody who feels like they're facing some kind of new anything which is that I was talking to Ryan Reynolds because I get to talk to interesting people for the magazine. And Ryan Reynolds, of course, was an actor who then got into business in a very serious way, started an advertising agency called Maximum Effort, Mint Mobile, uh, Aviation Gin. And he said to me that you know the transition was not easy. He didn't know how to do these things. But he said, to be good at something, you have to be willing to be bad. And that line, matters to me because it is challenging what I think people generally think of when they think of starting something new. I think they often think that they're going to try something and it's not going to work out that well. And therefore that is the sign that they shouldn't do it. They look around, they see other people doing it better. They say, well, I guess this isn't for me. But what Ryan is saying is that that's not true because everyone is bad at the start. And therefore the difference maker isn't whether or not you are good at something at the beginning. The difference maker is whether or not you are willing to be tolerating discomfort, whether you can tolerate being bad long enough to get to good. That makes all those hard things in the beginning feel a lot easier. Yeah, we were talking about this yesterday. Um, it's like, you know, Thomas Edison, right? We, the, the you know, famous knowings of how many light bulb iterations it took to get to the light bulb, right? right? I was like, at what point would we have quit trying to make that light bulb? You know, round 300, yeah, yeah, yeah. 500, um, the people right. that- Right, and, and there's that famous line, which I'm not sure he actually ever said, but it's been attributed to him related to that, which is as somebody said like, you know, have you wasted your time before he actually figured it out? And he said, no, I figured out 10,000 ways it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that by itself is also really useful. Yeah, and 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 failure and, and learnings is part of the process for anybody who wants to do something extraordinary. And it's like, yeah. it's like Michael Jordan, right? The missing more shots than you make. But so many times people get to that wall of thinking that if it's not just the good stuff, then it's, yeah. not, it's not worth doing. <laughs> That's right. It's just, it's part of the process. Most of the things aren't going to work out. And so we need to have a tolerance for that. 
and understand that everything that we do actually does have a purpose. It's just not always the purpose of succeeding. I heard you say something uh, in my research about experimentation. Can you kind of expand upon that? Because I think it kind of ties into this a little bit. Yeah, well, there's a lot to be said about experimentation, but the first thing that comes to mind when you prompt that is I had interviewed for my book, Build for Tomorrow, this brilliant woman named Katie Milkman, who is a professor at Wharton and wrote a book called How to Change. And she studies behavioral change. And I had asked her, what's the first thing that somebody should do if they want to make a change, but they don't exactly know what to do? And she said, the answer is not going to sound all that mind blowing, but the answer is experiment. Because what we tend to do is think of every new thing that we're doing as some kind of permanent commitment or at least long-term commitment. And people are afraid of that. You know, you're not gonna long-term commit to something you've never tried before, that's scary. And so you're not gonna do it at all. <laughs> and instead what we need to do is start to think of everything that we're doing as simply as an experiment. The, the stakes of an experiment are totally different. You're gonna just try it. You're gonna try it for three months and see what happens. Maybe set some kind of benchmarks. I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna see, you know, and if you try something and you like it, or you try something and you hate it, either way, in the context of an experiment, it has been a success because now you have more information than you had before. And I find that to be just a really valuable way of thinking. I've, I've, I've applied it to myself many, many times where I am going to just try this out Maybe it will work, maybe it will not. The stakes are very low. Mm. Yeah, and could you could you talk about that in the very first time you started doing public speaking? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess I did see that as an experiment because I didn't know if I would be any good at it, but I was I was willing to give it a go. And the reason for that was because it had appealed to me the idea of standing on a stage and talking to people. I, I was excited by that. I had done. I'd been on stages before, but you know, always like in a panel situation where you're just like sitting with a bunch of people, it's very low stakes. You don't have to own the space in any way, but now you're keynoting. And so I, I had been invited to give this keynote and it was in Scottsdale, Arizona. I don't know when, 2017. And I, I didn't know what I was doing at all. I'd never done anything like it. I'd never stood on a stage and just like talked and yet I had flown out to this event and I'm standing on the side of the stage. I, I, I put together a talk, I, I practiced it. I, I'm in my hotel room the night before, pacing back and forth, speaking to a wall. And then I, I'm i standing on the side of the stage the next morning and I'm being introduced by the guy, the MC. And I'm looking out at all these people in this hotel ballroom or whatever in Scottsdale. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if I'm gonna be any good at this. I don't know if they're gonna like what I'm gonna have to say. What can I, say to myself right now that will actually get me out onto this stage. And the thing that I came up with was, I can't wait to do this the second time. Because look, we're gonna do these things and they're gonna be hard. Like Ryan Reynolds says, you know, you're not gonna be very good at it. So how do you motivate yourself? And the answer has to be that you have to see a purpose to it. And the purpose as stated in, I can't wait to do this the second time, is that the purpose is just to get to the second time. Like imagine if this thing that you're doing that's really scary, the stakes of it are literally get through it to do it again. That's just the stakes, that's it. That's the only thing you have to do. I mean, at that point, I can stand on the side of the stage and basically think to myself, I don't know how to do this, but in 20 minutes, I will know so much more <laughs> than I did, I do right now. Like yeah. the only thing I have to do is go do it, is like get on the stage and do it. And then as soon as it's done, I have so much more information that I will never otherwise be able to get. The only way to get that information mm -hmm. is to walk out on the stage and get it. And that, that helps, that helps get out and do it. I can't wait to do this a second time. I still tell myself that in the, in, you know, in times where I'm doing something that feels uncomfortable because I know that in the future, it won't be. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's like training wheels. <laughs> it's like, you, yeah, at some point you have to take them off if you want to ride without them. Like, and I think that, that, step into the uncomfortable or the uncertainty is is what so many people get stuck at what what do you think the biggest reason that people do stop and they don't push forward into something unknown well i don't know that there's one reason i think fear i think discomfort uh i think 
that they start to see the amount of work that it will take. But, you know, a lot of people are asking themselves, I, I, I always, actually, it's funny, when I give keynotes, I, I now end with this point that I'm going to make to you right now because I used to make it in Q&As and people would always uh, want to talk to me about it afterwards. So I, I thought I might as well just bring this right into the thing. Um, and that is that I think that people often ask this question of everything that they do that's new or everything that they see that's new. And that question is, is this perfect? And the problem with that question is that the answer is always the same. The answer is no, it's not perfect. It's never perfect. Anything that you do, it's not perfect. So like anything that you try that's new. So if there's some new technology in the construction space, you're going to try it. It's, it's going to be imperfect. It just will. And so if we ask, is this perfect as a means of evaluating something? Well, then we have our answer. It's no. And then we're not going to try these new things or we're going to be constantly discarding them because they're not reaching whatever our impossible standard is. So what's a better question to ask? The better question to ask is, is this new problem better than the old problem? Because when we ask that, is this new problem better than the old problem? First of all, we're just being realistic. We're making room for problems. Problems are invalidators. Also, we're able to track progress through problems. And so now I'm trying some new piece of technology and yes, it's problematic, but is it a better problem than before? Is it more efficient? Is there, is it safer? It doesn't mean that it's not, there aren't things to fix, but there are, ne there are always going to be things to fix. Think of one thing in your life that is perfect. I can't think of a single thing <laughs> I, and I have a very happy life, but it, perfect? No. Yeah. So how are we to expect that new things will be perfect, but I want to see if it's simply a better problem because then I can focus on solving that one. Mm, yeah, that's awesome. I really appreciate that share. Um, what would you say um, along these lines? So we, we identify a technology, we identify that the technology is better than the old problem. And then we also mm -hmm. though have people in the industry that are maybe of an older generation that are afraid of new technologies. They don't want to even adopt it. Even if we showcase and show that it is better, what do you, how do you approach that conversation to the people that are like, we just want to stay in our way. What's your, what's your message there? I mean, look, a caveat to all of this is that not every new thing is amazing and not every new thing should replace your old things. So, you know, I, I mean, because th that's certainly a, a criticism that I think is fair to levy against people who are just kind of disruption minded, where it's just like everything that we have can be disrupted. Everything that we have doesn't have to be disrupted, but you need to be open to it. You need to explore it. You just do. Because otherwise, the reality is that you are going to be up against competitors who are exploring it and who are going to identify new opportunities that you're not even willing to engage with. And that puts you at a disadvantage. So the basics are, what are you doing and how are you doing it? And what do the people who you serve need? And are there ways to solve more of their problems or solve their problems better by changing some way about what you do. It's not easy. You know, I, 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 I write in the book about this concept called the bridge of familiarity. And the bridge of familiarity is, it's really the, a reminder that for innovators, they know the value of the thing that they have created so well that they're blind to how it doesn't make any sense to anybody else. And so uh, the way to try to communicate the value of something is not to go around saying, hey, I have this new thing, you should get rid of your old thing. People don't want that. People don't like that. People don't like new things. What they like are better versions of old things. So what we need to do is start with where they are, not where we are with our cool new thing, but where they are. And what are they comfortable with? What language do they use? What are their goals? What's their familiarity? and then start to build a bridge from them to us, understand what they need and start to frame everything that you're doing in terms of how it's an upgrade of something that they're already comfortable and familiar with. And look, I, 
I understand that people who've been doing something for a very long time are very comfortable the way that they're doing them and that they could see that making some kind of large change is too disruptive. And in some cases, they're going to be totally right, but they have to be aware of the times where they might be wrong and start to weigh the risk of action against the risk, the risk of inaction. Because there's a lot of risk in inaction. Mm -hmm. Inaction means that you're ceding ground to other people. And I think that we often focus too much on the risk of action without considering the potential harm that we're causing by staying the same. Mm. How do you choose what to act on? So there is no one formula for that. There's no one solution for that. You can start with looking at and gaming out very cold, hard reality reasonably what you're doing now and whether or not it's going to get you where you need to go next. I mean, let's just be really, really honest about it. And then take a look at what's changing around you and start to evaluate those things by how critical they are. I have uh, these friends, Jordan and Adam Bornstein, they run a consultancy called Pen Name Consulting. And they have a really simple, but I think profound way of evaluating the changes and risks in front of someone. And that is to ask whether or not it is a door or an engine. So in this metaphor, imagine that you're driving down the street and the door falls off. The door of the car falls off. Can you still drive? The answer is yes, the car still drives. It's not great to not have a door. You should get that fixed, <laughs> but you can still drive the car. But now imagine that you're driving down the street and the engine falls off. Can you drive the car? No, now the car is gone. The car is dead. It's not going anywhere. So now let's take a look at the things that you're seeing change in your industry, specific changes and ask, is it a door or is it an engine? Mm. Right? Is, is it a door that requires some kind of adjusting to, some kind of fixing? Or is it an engine, which is a real catastrophic event that is headed your way? Because, I mean, I, I, you know, like, I remember, I've talked to so many people. I remember this, ad, this guy in advertising tech, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, um, but um, he, he, you know, he, he had built this company and he was doing $30 million in revenue a year. And, uh, and then he saw that he, was, he had built off this like new way of targeting consumers with uh, online ads. And then he saw that this thing that he had developed was being developed elsewhere too. And two clients in a row said, you know, actually we're developing this internally so we don't really need to pay you as much anymore. And that was enough for him to say, I need to get out of this and I need to get out of it now because this is an engine. This mm. isn't a door, this is an engine and yeah, people aren't all going to develop his thing immediately. He could probably run it for another five years, making really good money before the, 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 you know, the, the storm clouds really start to gather. But by that point, he's so dug in and he doesn't have any time to react that he's going to be dead. So instead, what he needs to do is he needs to start right now, right now, it's the second that he sees an engine, which is what he did. He had this thriving company, it was bringing in a lot of money. He laid off the majority of the staff and he did a hard pivot into something else, which is what, uh, you know, he built the company that, that he has now, which is far more significant than the $30 million business that he had before. And I love those kinds of stories because mm. they're hard. That's hard, hard, hard work. That's doing something when everyone thinks you're crazy. That's laying people off, even though they didn't, they didn't do anything wrong. That's that, that'll keep you up at night, mm. but it's also what will allow your business to survive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we have a few more minutes here. One thing I'd love for you to hit on a little bit is mm -hmm. when you talk about kind of your identifying what you do or who you are. Um, mm. You talk about your voice and your messaging, if you know what I mean. I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I, you know, this is, I have a whole exercise in the book about this, but I'll, I'll just kind of make it quick here, which is that, um, I think that oftentimes the thing that makes us feel so disrupted is that we are tying our identities too closely to the product of our work, the roles that we occupy, the tasks that we do. 
And therefore, when any of that changes, and it will, it doesn't feel like it just changed to our work. It feels like a change to our identity. It feels like a loss of identity. And that's very scary. That's how we get to panic. And so what I realized is that what everyone needs is to identify this thing that I've come to call the thing that does not change in times of change. What's the thing about you that does not change in times of change? And what I would challenge you to do is to dig really deep past identifying uh, with your skills or your or your the, the product of your work, past you know the, the thing that you just kind of do everything, do every day or that you've been known for, or even that you've worked hard for. And instead, go so deep down that what you can do is create a mission statement for yourself. A very short sentence that starts with the word I, and then every word is carefully selected because it is not anchored to something that is easily changeable. For me, for example, mine is not, I, I used to think of myself as a newspaper reporter or a magazine editor. Now, I tell stories in my own voice, seven words. I tell stories in my own voice. That language is important to me. I know that it sounds semantic, but it's not because I tell stories, for example, liberates me from thinking of myself as a magazine editor, which is an easily disruptable category. I, I'm a magazine editor until somebody fires me from being a magazine editor. That's not a very comfortable place to be. But I tell stories, nobody can take that away from me. In my own voice, that's me establishing the terms for how I wanna operate at this stage of my career. The more that we have something like this, the more we recognize that we have transferable value, transferable skills, that the thing that we wake up in the morning and provide to the world every day isn't actually just like the, 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 the order of operations of whatever our job is, but it goes deeper than that. And therefore, when change happens, that's fine because all we need to do is figure out another way to express the thing that's really deep inside of us. Mm, thank you for sharing that. I, uh, when I heard that, I, I really resonated with it. And I was like, man, mm. this is something I needed to hear because I, going through all these different changes of different technology, I was, I was always like, who am I? What do I, I'm a laser scanning expert that teaches you how to do this, or I'm a drone pilot. Yeah. And I was like, no, hearing that, I was like, I got to reverse down to like, what at the core do I want to do for people? And it's, and I'm mm. not finalized all the way there, but it's like, I no. inspire change through innovation and technology adoption, not a specific love technology, that. not a specific company. So I, yeah, I love, I love sharing that with people. Thank you for sharing it with our, our audience. Oh, I'm so glad you thought about it that way. Could you speak a little bit about working your next job? Yeah, sure. So that's, um, you know, I, I think another way that you can prepare yourself for change is to be always mindful of how the things that you do today can open up opportunities tomorrow. So my argument is that everybody should be what I what I call use that language there. Work your next job, um, and uh, think of it this way: in front of you right now are two sets of opportunities. Opportunity set A, opportunity set B. Opportunity set A is everything that's asked of you. So everything that you do at your work, everything that you are evaluated on everything somebody needs from you, that's opportunity set A. Opportunity set B is everything that's available to you that nobody's asking you to do. And that could be literally anything. It could be something at work where you take on new roles, new responsibilities, but it could also be outside of work where you like listening to podcasts and you decide to start a podcast. And my argument is that opportunity set B, the things that are available to you that nobody's asking you to do are always more important, infinitely more important. Not to say opportunity set A is unimportant, it is important, you gotta do it. But if you only focus on the things that you are already doing, then you will only be qualified to do the things you're already doing. Whereas opportunity set B is where growth happens. That's where you create the next set of opportunities. That's where you develop skills that are gonna open doors later. You don't need to know exactly how, but you better start right now thinking about what your opportunity set B is and then start to pursue it. And you know, maybe it's not, maybe the first thing that you try isn't exactly going to be right. Maybe you don't know what it's going to be. That's fine. Just rewind this podcast 20 something minutes to where we were talking about experiments because that's ultimately what you're going to start doing is running little experiments and seeing what matters and what's valuable. But in, 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 in so many ways, the things that I do every day and the things that are bringing me the most growth are the product not of the full-time jobs that I've held, but rather of the things that I pursued on the side. Mm. Very powerful. Well, I know we're at time here. I want to end with just last question. Um, yeah. What What are you excited about or looking forward to ahead for, for you and the journey you're riding? Um, well, the thing that I am obsessed with every day 
lately is, and this isn't going to be some like radical idea here, it's a newsletter. Um, and the reason for that is because, look, if you're, you know, it's, it's you've probably heard it a million times, but um, a newsletter is really the most important tool anybody can have with their audience because it's the most direct you can get. And, uh, you know, social media is always going to feed you through an algorithm. You don't actually own that contact. Newsletters, you do. And I have been talking with people who have been very smart about building their newsletters and then turned it into real monetizable products, but not because, you know, they're just figuring out how to make money, but because they're really figuring out how to provide valuable services to the people that they're connecting and uh, connecting to. And that is something that I've wanted to figure out for a while. And this is the year I really decided to commit to it. So um, anyway, I have this newsletter. It's called One Thing Better. And you can find it at onethingbetter.email. That's an actual email or actual um, domain. Oh, awesome. You just plug it into a browser. Onethingbetter.email. Just plug it into a browser, you'll get it. And, um, it, you know, and it, One Thing Better is now, I it went through a big rebrand. It used to be something else. I've started to be really strategic about its growth. And I'm just so excited every day when I get emails from people who are like, this is the only email that I open. And, um, <laughs> and, and like that, like building a product that's meaningful to people that matters and that you know has a lot of growth potential is incredibly exciting. So that's the thing that I'm really focused on. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. It's uh, it's really powerful when you can find something that you enjoy doing that helps yeah. other people. That is yeah, so much sure more is. rewarding. <laughs> totally. And I should say, I didn't even explain what it is. But anyway, one thing better is each week, you uh, I, I send out one way to improve your work and build a career or company you love. Mm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we look forward to learning more from you. And uh, we've already said internally, we're like, at some point, we're bringing you out. We want to get you at one of our events. I think our oh, awesome. our community is going through a lot of change, a lot of disruption. And we're like, we need more people to speak into what's going on in the construction world. Yeah. So. I, I would I would absolutely love to. I've actually, I've spoken, I've spoken to a few events and conferences um, like either in or adjacent to your space. And so I'm, I'm aware that there is a lot of change happening. And um, there are also a lot of, you know, a lot of people who've been in the space for a very long time who are not always thrilled about that. Um, I, I was <laughs> I was in Texas uh, talking to um, uh, folks in the, I know, I'm, I know this isn't the same, but in the oil and gas space. Yep. And, uh, and yep. I was seeing seeing a very similar kind of thing. And I was warned that I'm going to walk in and there are going to be a bunch of grizzled old timers who like don't want to hear this from <laughs> me at all. Um, and then there are going to be other people who are really responsive to it. And that, that's exactly what I saw. And, you know, that's fine. Look, everyone has to approach this at their own level of comfort, but I, I, I can, all I can do is tell you what I've learned from the smartest entrepreneurs that I've spent time with and, and hopefully it's useful. No, that's awesome. And that's perfect. That That is right in our alley. I mean, mm -hmm. the companies we're working with are oil and gas companies, they're retail builders. It's all industries that have anything to do with construction are mm. going through this change of new technologies that are getting into the the workflows. And it's, it's causing like some of the stuff we talked about throughout this conversation, just hesitancy, um, even when it's uh, a change that needs to happen, there's difficulties. So Right. Um, uh, looking forward to sharing this out with our audience and then again, uh, having you out at some point as well. So thank you very much Love for that. your time. Oh, hey, thanks guys. This is a lot of fun and uh, I guess I'll see you then. All right. All right we man. will, uh, we'll be sharing out your links. Everybody needs to definitely check out that book. I just finished it. Uh, lots of value packed in there. So thank you for everything you're doing, Jason. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. I oh, appreciate it. All right. Talk soon.